So uh, as my, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. So as advertised, I'm Chris Wiggins. I'm affiliated mostly with Columbia University. Uh, one day a week, I'm at the New York Times, and I thought I would divide our time into two topics. One is uh, a bit of context about what's ha what is the deal with data at the New York Times, and then a bit about what I've learned from comparing data science as we know it in the academy with data science as it's done in the real world, or at least at, at the New York Times. And by finding things that are common, maybe we'll find things that are universal throughout all of data science, which since data science is not really defined, is easy to do. So, um, yes. So, uh, yeah, so a as promised, I'm gonna divide this talk into two different parts. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with just a little bit of context. So a little bit of context and background. This is really before the actual talk. I'll, I'll just let you know where I'm coming from. So here's where I'm coming from. Uh, where I'm coming from is I started maybe in the early 90s doing research in modeling biology, which in the early 90s, most of biology, a lot of biology was done in the same way. It was done in the 19th century, which is by looking at stuff. This, for example, is Haemophilus influenzae. It was the first slide identifying this critter. And that was sort of the prime modality of, of doing things in biology for a long, long time. And, and still, when you pick up figure one of most biology papers, there's a picture of something, right? A picture of a slide or a picture of a gel or something like that. That's, that's sort of the, the throughput level of biology when I started trying to learn physical models in biology. And I was coming from physics as an undergraduate tradition, and I thought, well, you know, we should use the the style of modeling complex systems that you have in physics to try to understand things in biology, which is really an audacious goal because physics is sort of all about systems where you get to choose the complexity. Right? When it gets too complex, you say, oh, that's chemistry. Right? And <laughs> biology, of course, is just, biology is just a mess. So it's a very audacious thought to think that you can apply thinking of physics to um, biology. And I can still remember the day in uh, 1995 when a graduate student came in uh, carrying Science Magazine, and this was the cover image of Science Magazine, and this is the same critter, right, 103 years later, but instead of being a picture of some bugs and some snot, which I think is what this actually was, this is the entire user's manual for this critter, right, the entire genome. Unfortunately, it's been written in a language you do not know, right, in a, in a language that only has four characters, and, it, and the language wasn't even written by a human. It was written by some terrible biased Monte Carlo algorithm. Right? And so your statistical task is to figure out what the hell this this manual says in this language that you do not know, right? And that, that sort of began a, a radical change in the relationship between biology and numbers, uh, which was very exciting and, and very painful. So this was a very painful time in biology, the late 90s, as people started to sequence whole critters, uh, including you, by the way, like by the end of the, the millennium, right? The, the humans had been at least rough draft sequenced. And it was the, and it was a kind of pain that I think you see in many other fields of human endeavor. You know, like if you go read the Moneyball book and you've got people doing statistical analysis of players and then there's other people saying, no, look at his legs or look at his girlfriend or whatever, you know, covariates they were using before they had data to value players. That sort of pain and, and the pain between people who are quantitative and the people who are doing it some other way, uh, you know, I, I think you see that pain happening to a lot of fields as they become data driven. Uh, so that was an exciting time, and, and, and I think that we learned a lot, we human beings, learned a lot of lessons as biology became data-driven that you see in other fields. Uh, so what did we do with this knowledge? What did we do with whole genomes? Well, um, here's an example of something that we did, and here by we, I don't mean humans, I mean we, me and my co-authors a few years ago. So a, an example of what you might do when you have a field that's been around for centuries, and by the way, I should say that I was not raised a biologist. My last biology class was in ninth grade, and we cut up a frog, and that's all I remember about it. Um, but we, my co-authors and I, one of the things we have, an example of what you might do when you have abundant data is to take a question like, if you have a lot of genomes from the same uh, species, but many different individuals, how might you say something about the way those different individuals have been evolving. So the sort of orthodox way since the 19th century, and this is actually Charles Darwin's sketch from his notebook picturing the origin of species, that maybe you have one species and then it gets a little differentiated and you have multiple species. Right? This is an excellent model right? in that it's um, interpretable. It's not necessarily predictive, but it's, it's a good model in the sense of being interpretable. 
Yeah, it, it doesn't really tell you a lot about how to fit data to it, right? And in fact, if, if you've ever looked at um, inferring phylogenetic trees as a field, you'll know that that's a very complex field. Lots of people arguing that they have the right way of doing it. Um, so for example, I was working with some virologists and they had many species of viruses that had been evolving. And some of those viruses had been evolving in pigs and some had been evolving in birds. And you could think, well, I'm going to do what Uncle Charles said I should do and I'm going to try to infer some tree and maybe the birds will be over yonder, uh, bird flu will be over yonder, and pig flu will be over yonder. But that's really damn hard. So actually what we did was we just built a classifier. So we used a machine learning algorithm that would tell you if you look at a genome, did it come from a pig or did it come from a bird? Which I know sounds like an academic question, but if you're, say, the government of China and a new flu breaks out in humans, you have to decide, should we kill all the pigs or kill all the birds? So that was the kind of <laughs> very implied question that we were thinking about. And uh, you know, there's sort of a lesson here from, uh, from Uncle Vladimir, from Vladimir Vodnik, as, as he likes to say, don't solve a difficult intermediate problem. Right? Like Vodnik likes to talk about not doing density estimation and an inference if you want to do classification. You should just do classification. So we didn't try to build a tree. We just said, can you build an algorithm that tells the difference between pig viruses and, and bird viruses? We also wanted to do something that was interpretable, so we made the primitive features in this model questions that have meaning to biologists, like is this protein substring present or not? If so, then add some score, add 0.36 to your score, uh, and then ask this next question. By the way, if, for those of you who know this kind of thing, this is a boosted alternating decision tree. It's like a quantitative game of 20 questions, and then at the end you end up with a sum of scores such that you get a high score if you were in a bird and a low score if you were in a pig. Right, so this is an example of taking, instead of trying to do the tree thing, which has some intuition, let's just turn it into a prediction problem. And then we don't have to interpret the result of our modeling, we just ask our algorithm, did we get a plus one or a minus one? But we build it out of primitive features such that we stand a chance of going back to the biologists and opening up the black box and saying, here's how the algorithm works. Right? And here's how to understand the working of these algorithms in, term, in terms of things that are meaningful to you. And those are the sorts of tasks that I think carry over well between what happens in computational biology or data science, you know, applying machine learning to some particular domain, and the business world. Like when we say data science in the business world, I find that <laughs> we're frequently doing the same thing. Uh, and qualitatively, what I'm trying to do in, in both of the times and in bi computational biology is to take people's intuitions and see if you can embody those intuitions in a prediction algorithm. In this case, the biologist has intuitions that there are certain protein substrings that matter, that you know, do something. And so we want to ask, we want to build a, 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 an interesting model out of very simple features so that when you sum them together, you get something that's predictive, but then the individual units are themselves interpretable. And that's what we try to do. That's what I find that I, I'm trying to do frequently in the real world. How does this relate to the real world? So, um, you know, that thing, we now call it data science, applications of machine learning in, in the real world, or applications of machine learning to some domain. Many companies are now doing that at scale, at, at web scale, right? So you might work for a company, and that company might have a website, right? And the New York Times, for example, has a website. Right. And that website is an opportunity to collect abundant data. So uh, you may think that data science is only the purview of recent companies, you know, companies like Google or Yahoo, or Facebook, or whoever. This company is very old. Right? This is a 163-year-old company. So it's very exciting to be working there and seeing how data is transforming a very old industry. And I should say, it's not a company that's um, sitting still. Like you think, well, 163-year-old, it's an incumbent. What's exciting is that it's an incumbent whose business model from like 1851 through 2004 sort of evaporated. You know, like the whole structure of advertising via dead trees just totally changed over the last decade. Uh, and so, although it's an incumbent in the sense that of being old, you know, it's a company that's very interested in trying to figure out what is the future of journalism. Like, how do we build a future of sustainable journalism where the internet is the mechanism of conveyance? rather than the dead tree, or some combination of the both. So you probably, let me say a little bit about what's happening with data at the New York Times. So there's some things that you've probably seen a lot of. So for example, you've probably seen interactive graphs at, graphics at the New York Times. If you haven't, uh, I urge you to go look at this short URL, bit.ly, NYT Interactive 2013, for a nice review of all the awesome things that the interactive news team did in 2013. This is from a graphic that shows you 
uh, how the architecture of New York changed uh, during the Bloomberg days. Um, great interactive news group. You may be aware that uh, New York Times has an R&D lab. Some of you may know Mike Dewar, he's a former postdoc of mine, he's now there uh, doing all sorts of cool R&D. You should check out mitlabs.com to see a lot of their beautiful projects. Um, the things I'm going to talk about are neither of those. It's neither public facing nor is it sort of R&D about what the future of news looks like. Uh, I should also say, before I talk about what I do, New York Times has a history of being a very developer-friendly company. Way back when, in like ancient times, 2008, the New York Times put out an API. Uh, here's, a, here's a blog post about uh, releasing an API so you could search for things with, a, with an unknown guy named Brock. I mean, he was already known. But, uh, you know, an example post where you can access via API search the New York Times content. Uh, these APIs are still active, just so you know that it's not something that was released in 2008 and then put to sleep. This is a, a post by uh, Rob Spector, who many of us know, he's a local hacker in town, where he saw somebody tweet, oh, it would be cool if my whole music could be uh, the top news from the New York Times, and he went and built it mm -hmm. using New York Times API, so this is a live thing. Um, another thing that I don't do, but I think is emblematic of how data the New York Times is, many of you have probably seen this new sh um, section the upshot, where many people are advancing data journalism. Uh, and I think this is from the first day when they released the upshot just last week. There it is, Tuesday, April 22. Uh, and they're not just putting out news stories that are data informed. They're actually sharing their code, which I think is super cool. So here's the GitHub page for the upshot. It's like a section of the New York Times where you can download code and you can redo the story yourself if you'd like to. Uh, you know, for many of us, we've been saying for years, oh, it would be really cool in terms of reproducibility if someday, you know, mainstream media, you know, articles will come with code and data, and they're actually doing that. So you can go and download the Excel spreadsheets for some of their data. I'm not talking about any of that. Uh, <laughs> that's cool. I encourage you to invite, I don't know, Randy Cox and everybody from those teams. That, that's not what I'm interested in doing. I'm not very good at it. So I'm interested in something else. Uh, I'm interested in the data that comes from the abundant interactions between everyone and the uh, company. Okay? And the company actually has a lot of data. So you can go to mytco.com and you can see uh, much more data than I would release if I were in charge. But you can see all sorts of information about how many people have been looking at the website of the New York Times in the last hour or at the last day, how many people are subscribing. Right? There's a lot of data there that's very much on the back end. So not public-facing stuff that's going to become data journalism, not public-facing stuff that's going to become interactive graphics, just back-end stuff that you get just from having a website. There's a lot of data that you have to try to understand how people engage with your product. Right? It's a bit like doing user surveys, except at ridiculous <coughs> scale. Right? So that's the kind of thing that I think is very exciting about trying to apply data science at the New York Times. That's the kind of thing that I'm interested in. Uh, this is not new news that the New York Times is a website that has data. Uh, just to sort of uh, put things in perspective, New York Times was featured prominently in this story from 60 Minutes. You can see he is terrified of the New York Times, that guy is. And he's pointing out how the New York Times is involved in collecting your data. The New York Times does not sell your data to other people. I think I should put that in perspective, although some of you may have seen the news. New York Times is an example of a website, though, which means you know, there's all sorts of tools that you have as a website for figuring out how people are engaging with your product. Right? So this is an example of how the New York Times uses other services. Some of you may know this company, which is here in New York. The point is, anyone who has a website has a, the opportunity to list them to their customers at scale. Right? Like Everyone who interacts with your product is telling you how they feel about your product. Right? And the New York Times has a pretty manifold product. Right? Multiple articles, multiple interactive fe features. It also has subscriptions. There's lots and lots of data to help the New York Times understand better what people like, why people stick around, if they stick around. Uh, all those things that you would normally do by you know, doing customer surveys, you can really do at scale if you have a website, which the New York Times has a website. So the kind of thing you might think to do is something like we did with viruses. You know, like, wouldn't it be cool if you could just take all of the different attributes of people looking at your company, or looking at your website, and figure out, you know, could you tell the difference between people who are one particular type or another particular type? You know, people who do one thing or another thing, right? It's the analog of figuring out, is this virus coming from pigs or from uh, birds, 
right? If you have something that you know that's business relevant, it would be great if you could take a lot of those data and do machine learning on it the same way that people do in computational biology or in Moneyball or in many other fields as it's now understood. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I think is, is an exciting opportunity uh, for many companies, including for the New York Times. For example, the New York Times doesn't have a short, well, the New York Times aims not to have short-term relationships with its readers, right? It's trying to create a community of people who are loyal readers. So you might ask, you know, what is the genome like of loyal subscribers? Right? Is there some way that you can figure out from the way people interact with the product? Is this, does this look like somebody who's a loyal subscriber or somebody who's not a loyal subscriber? Who's gonna, who's gonna stay and who's gonna go? And why? Why do they stick around? Right? And so that's the analog here. You know, there are business questions that you'd like to ask. You'd like to frame these prediction problems in such a way that they work, you know, that they're predictive. We'd also like to have them be interpretable so you can actually help people, help normal people, right? People who have questions. That's what I think is exciting about uh, working at the New York Times. Uh, and again, we're, you know, the, the idea of doing machine learning is approaching this problem using machine learning is different from traditional ways of thinking about your customers. I'm not trying to break people into segments like soccer moms and diehard dads or loyal Bob or something like that. I just want to look at the data and let the data tell me what are the attributes that turn out to be predictive. Right? But I want my primitive features here to be features that are individually interpretable so I can work with people and answer questions from a particular domain, just like you do in data science in any field. So I want to move from intuition to prediction. So um, I mean, one of, the, one of the pieces of context about working at a place like the New York Times is it's, it's still data science just like you know, we do in academia when you take ma machine learning and you try to apply it to a science like biology. Uh, but you get to do it with the web and in the web, you know, before I started working with uh, the New York Times, you know, I thought of the web as like the online presence. You know, if, you're a, if you're a publisher, then the web is a way for you to put your content out there. Right? It's sort of like a replacement for the dead tree. Uh, but it's much more like that, much more than that. And so something that's been exciting to realize is that it's also uh, a microscope. Right? So just because you have a company, you, uh, just because you have a website, right, you have a microscope into what all your, in, your users or your subscribers want, right? what they like, how they like it, uh, what makes them come back, what's correlated with loyalty, what's correlated with not loyalty. Uh, something else that I do think is exciting and, and which uh, I'll talk a little bit about is it's also an experimental tool. So right, every time anybody says, oh, they're going to A-B test it, right? they're using the web as an experimental tool. So a website is not just a place for you to put your content online. It's a place for you to look at your uh, users right, and see what they like. But it's also a place for you to experiment. And I'll say a little bit about more than that. And something that's exciting, although I, I don't really have much to say about this, uh, is that <coughs> the web is also an optimization tool. Right? You, you can script what content you provide to people. So there's nothing to stop you from thinking of the web as an optimization tool. Now, I would not say that that's particularly true of the New York Times. You know, what, what determines what you see is news judgment right, at the New York Times. It's not, it's not the case that things are being optimized. Right? You're seeing something that's very carefully curated. And that, I think, is you know, part of the reason why the company still exists. But uh, it's something for you to think about. Every time you have a website, you have much more than just a place to put your stuff. You have a chance to interact with your customers, to perform experiments, to perform, perform optimization. That's all the context I wanted to say. Now that I've said something about the context and like where I'm coming from, I thought I'd say what I've learned. So um, I thought I'd say things that I've learned that are the same, or at least very common, between data science as it's done in the academy, and we try to do data science for biology, say, and data science in the real world uh, in the context of the business. So uh, done with the header, let me actually have the body of the talk. So uh, let me say a few words about what I think are common requirements in data science. And some of you are data scientists, some of you are aspiring data scientists, some of you manage data scientists, some of you are recruiting data scientists. So just so I know my audience, how many of you are data scientists? How many of you are aspiring data scientists? How many of you manage data scientists? Okay. So that's a pretty even mix, I have to say. So um, here are things that I think that you should either demand of yourself or of the people of your manage that you manage or demand of yourself once you become a data scientist uh, in the future. And these are requirements that I, that I think are there because I see the same thing in the real world that I see in 
computational biology or in data science applied to the sciences. So let me, I've broken these up into a few different ideas. Uh, one is a set of practices. Like there are certain practices that I think are just good hygiene for being a data scientist in the world. You should demand these practices of yourself and the people you manage. Separately are, are concrete skills, like the things that you do that make you a data scientist and not something else. Uh, and then, more loosely, culture. Right? There's a set of cultural practices that I think are common between data scientists in the sciences and data science in business. So, uh, practice. What are some of the practices of a data scientist that I think are common between the two worlds? One is the desire and the ability to reframe domain questions as machine learning tasks. So um, an example I already alluded to was, let's say that you would like to know, if you give me a virus, can I tell you if it was a pig virus or a bird virus? That's a domain question. Right? But I could reframe that as a prediction problem. I want to have an algorithm which takes as input your uh, genome or your genome translated into amino acid sequence for some protein segment and takes as output a number such that that number is positive if you're a pig virus and negative if you're a bird virus. So that's an example of reframing a domain question as a machine learning task. That's only useful to people from the domain if at the end you're able to go tell them why the thing works. I mean, it's an engineering win if you get a model that's predictive. It's a science win if you can tell them why. If you can tell them what are the features that actually discriminate between pigs and birds. Um, this was particularly a problem in biology because you know, um, when people started sequencing whole critters, then they started doing things like measuring the on-off state of every gene in a critter at once. And there was just no rules about what statistics you did. I mean, if you look at those papers in computational biology, it really looks a lot like amateur baseball statistics. People would just do whatever with uh, the data, right? Because there's no models to compare it to, no models to fit to. Um, very little uh, sort of, you know, it's not like F equals MA, and then you compare F equals MA to this hairball of, of genes, right? Uh, so there was a lot of, um, there was a lot to be learned in those early days. Uh, it was very difficult to take questions of interest, like what gene is controlling which other gene? That's a domain question, and reframe it as a particular machine learning task. That's difficult. Another practice that I think people who do data science should keep in mind is it's much better to be wrong than to do something that's nice. So this hairball is not wrong, right? It's, it's neither right or wrong. So this is just a picture that you can get from a scientific publication about a bunch of genes and they interact with each other. Maybe gene 137 is connected to gene 1066. Oh, but uh, it's sort of an art project. It's not something that really can be made false. As opposed to like the output of a supervised learning algorithm. Right? You can hold out data and you can see, is my model right or wrong? Uh, and it's, I think it's a far better practice for you to try to build models that can be wrong than to build something that's kind of cool to look at. Right? And it's not even wrong. Uh, I think also that's a piece of career advice that I've given to my students who have gone into startups is try to do some data science that's relevant to the product and relevant to the business model. Because when times get tough, if you're just doing something that's nice, you're, you're, you're going to be expendable. Right? You don't want to do something that's just kind of cool to have around. You want to do something that's addressing some core business problem, uh, and that's actually relevant to the business. So better to be wrong and, and than to do something that's just cool to look at. Uh, another difficult task is to be relevant. So for example, um, you know the thing about China, right? They actually do have to kill birds or pigs, right? So try to predict the thing that's actually relevant to something that's a clear use case uh, for the people you're trying to collaborate with. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and this is not as easy as it sounds. Because you can do statistics on lots of different stuff, right? But there's a difference between say, saying, I'm going to look at the player attributes for every player on my team and predict how many wins, because people care about wins. And I'm going to look at all the player attributes and I'm going to rank players by some statistic I just made up such that Derek Jeter is the best. And you can definitely see that kind of style of thought in amateur baseball statistics and sometimes in computational biology. So try to focus on something that's actually relevant to the people with whom you are collaborating. This is not so easy. Um, for example, there was a Twitter kerfuffle recently uh, about what are the metrics that you should be looking at for news. So here's a tweet from Tony Hale. Many of you may know Tony Hale. He's the CEO of Chartbeat. 
um, saying, you know, we found no correlation between social shares and people actually reading. What does he mean? He means if you're, let's say you're a publisher, like the New York Times, right? and you'd like to know that you're generating content that people find engaging. Engaging could be quantified in like seven different ways. Give yourself half an hour and you'll think of seven to so maybe ten different ways of quantifying <laughs> engagement. One is how much are people sharing it? You know, like if you go to the New York Times, one thing you can do is you can click on the button that says mail this story to my grandma. You could just mail the URL, but uh, there's a button that you, know, you could use that for tracking sharing. Um, and people actually reading, well, part of Tony's company is to sell uh, a tool that would allow you to look at the actual time that people have spent on a page. So Chartbeat will help, will tell you how long you've spent on the page, your scroll depth, it'll tell you a bunch of metrics about how you've engaged, other than did you click or did you not click. Right. So uh, what Tony's saying here is, you know, other companies that might be telling you, we're, we're going to make your stuff really viral, or we're going to make people share your stuff, he's saying that's actually irrelevant because people actually reading the stuff is not correlated with how they share. Well, I mean, how did they find that out? It's not like you can go download the GitHub and download all the data they use, right? It's, it's 140 characters. So uh, a, another step in this particular Twitter kerfuffle was this response from Jonah Peretti. Again, this is not happening in peer-reviewed publications or even on GitHub. This is happening in 140 characters. Jonah's saying, well, actually on BuzzFeed, sharing increases as people spend more time reading. So, and then he proves it with this text bot uh, in some software that, there, that you may or may not use. So, he, you know, it's, it's very difficult to know if you're measuring the right thing in the real world. So these are people who, you know, they're founders, right? They spend all their day thinking about how to quantify engagement with publications, right? It's still very difficult to know, are you optimizing the right thing? Right. Tony's advocating for optimizing how much you read, when he's saying it doesn't correlate with how much you share. Jonah's interested in how much you share. Jonah, by the way, is the founder of BuzzFeed, right? And BuzzFeed spends a lot of time looking at how much people share their content. Yes, please. Thank you for being the brave person. First, to ask a question. Yeah. So, like, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry and science biology, I mean, having a not having a declarative hypothesis is very interesting because the data that you you get, like out of a genome-wide map, for example, is great in forming the next hypothesis. So, let's say it's a data point you didn't consider, but you want to consider some other data because you learned something new about some other gene that somebody else studied. By having a declarative hypothesis, like kind of like the the picture on the right. You're sort of limiting your scope. You're just answering one kind of question to one, one <coughs> kind of problem. You're ignoring all the other data that's out there. Is that the right approach? I'm not advocating for hypotheses. Uh, and I'll, I'll get there later about <coughs> hypotheses. What I'm advocating is for doing statistical methods where at the end you know if it was good or bad. Right? I mean, this is, for example, why people put p-values on things. Right. Yeah. Uh, so. Irrespective of what you think your hypothesis I is. I feel like that's a p-value. Those, those values are getting. I, I can put a p-value on it. Right. Okay, let's talk about p-values. I, <laughs> I don't. I know that they're horrible. Please don't. No, I, I get that. See, so you, you don't. I get you that. I'm, I'm, a cam, I'm a cam. I'm a cam. I'm a cam with, with you, if you ask me. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can put p-value on it if, if that's your. your don't value. do that. Okay. <laughs> um, but what I mean by that is not that there should be one hypothesis that you're testing. You can go into something with no particular hypothesis. Or in a way, what I'm doing is I'm going in, I'm going in here with zillions of hypotheses and I'm allowing the data to define the model for me. For example, my hypothesis is that some nonlinear combination of presence or absence of all of the possible 20 to the 10, you know, 10 mers of amino acids, some nonlinear combination of them is going to convey predictive power. That's not one hypothesis, right? That's an extremely high dimensional class of hypotheses, right? In fact, in the business, this would be called a hypothesis space. So part of the machine learning mindset is not to go into it with one, hy one hypothesis at all, but to have some uh, controlled and you know, finite dimensional space of hypotheses and allow the data to reveal to you what is the hypothesis that has the most power. Right? And power here doesn't necessarily mean p-value, it means the ability to make accurate predictions and held out data. So keep in your mind three different mindsets. <coughs> One is the sci scientific method as it was told to you in fifth grade or maybe kindergarten, right, that you should start with the hypothesis. Another is that you should take that hypothesis and you should p-value on it relative to some particular null model. And if you want me to, I'll go into problems with that, particularly if you're multivariate problem. Don't get started. Um, and another is to create 
a, a high dimensional but finite dimensional space of possible hypotheses models and allow and use the right math to tell you which of those models is the model that makes the most accurate predictions on held out data. And the third of those I think of is really the machine learning mindset. So I'm not at all saying that um, you should choose one hypothesis. Right? In fact, the machine learning thing to do is to carve out some finite hypothesis space, and then this is one graphic representation of one model that comes out. So instead of picking out one hypothesis in advance, you have a high dimensional and possibly infinite number of hypotheses, and you let the data decide for you what is the right model. Right? So you associate a hypothesis with a prediction model. What I mean by being wrong is it spits out a number, and you can leave out data and see, did you get it right or wrong? So it's an imputed model, uh, it's, it's a model, well, the language I would use is that it's a, an example of supervised learning rather than unsupervised learning, where you have a particular label you are trying to predict, and I leave out that label, I leave out some data, and then armed with new data, I try to see if my model makes accurate predictions of that label and how that data. Right? Which is a very, it's a small city within the continent of statistics. Right? So there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a big continent, the continent of statistics. Right? And within that continent is a small island or a country called supervised learning. And that is a place where I can sleep well at night, because at the end, I know whether or not, I, I at least knew that I could have been wrong, right? And if my model generate, gets it right 50% of the time and the data, is, the data are distributed with 50% bias, then I know that, I've, that, that it's crap, right? And it's nice to know that at least it would have been possible to have crap, which not all statistical methods will give you. Uh, right. Okay, so being relevant. So, you know, these are, these are statistical questions being asked for real business purpose, right? Tony has a company that'll tell you how long people are on the page, and he's saying you should measure how long people have been on the page. Jonah has a company that where they keep track of how much people share stuff, and he's telling you you should keep track of how much people share stuff, right? So again, this is it's a, it's a difficult thing to be relevant, right? And to and to do statistics in a way that's addressing what's a clear business purpose. And these fights are not always played out in peer-reviewed publications, where of course everyone shares their data and their code. Har har. Right. I mean, so like, even in peer-reviewed publications, it's difficult to know, like, are people measuring the right thing and are they doing the right way? Let alone in the real world. Let alone on Twitter, which is 140 simulacrum of the real world. Um, so it's difficult to be relevant. Let's say you are a website, right? If you are a website, you have to decide, do I want to optimize how much people share? How long do people spend on the page? Not even optimize. Should I even be looking at that? Right? And if you've been following, there's a lot of publications this spring about how in journalism, there are some publications where the journalists are not even allowed to ask those questions. There are some publications that don't allow the journalists to look at their metrics. But let's say you forget about the journalists, what about like on the business side? Should I be trying to get people to read a story, to click on a story, to spend a lot of time in story, to scroll all the way down, to go buy stuff? I don't think there's a link here for buy stuff, but you know, maybe I want to get people to go buy t-shirts. Uh, maybe I want people to subscribe, maybe I want people to register. There's a lot of different ways to quantify engagement, right? And this is just one company. Whatever company you're associated with, find something that's quantifiable and that's relevant to the people who are not running R. You know, find the thing that's relevant and, and is, it is clearly of business relevance, right? It'll save you your job, it'll keep you from just calculating an infinite number of things, and it'll help engage people in the fact that data are valuable. Uh, so that's one practice. Hypotheses. Hypotheses are not the same as data jeopardy. So one, one thing that happens a lot in biology is, is donate trouvé, found data. So some experimentalist does some experiment and then they hand you several megabytes or gigabytes of data and say, here, cluster this. Make it a tree, because I have an NIH proposal due next year. Uh, similarly in business, like you have a website, it's spitting out lots of data all the time. Just sort of munging those data and repackaging it saying, you know, there's the median of six, you know, is not the same as actually trying to say, are people who are sharing also reading more, or are they not, right? That would be an example of a hypothesis you might try to uncover by looking at the data, right? And that's a hypothesis that does have business relevance, for example, to Tony and Jonah, right? They have companies where their businesses are sort of about sharing or reading or both, or viral. Uh, so it's nice when you can go into a problem and actually have some hypothesis. You have some clear direction 
rather than just sort of screwing with the data until Derek Jeter is the best. Okay. So uh, going into data with uh, hypotheses is great, but sometimes you fight with the data you have and not the data you want. How do you go about getting the data you want? Well, befriend experimentalists. So a painful lesson for me from biology uh, is that it's very different to just do some analysis on somebody's data. Even if, even if you go and show the experimentalist who took the data, it's very different than actually working with an experimentalist to come up with the experiment themselves. Okay. Uh, and this is not new news, right? So when you were in kindergarten, somebody told you about the scientific method. Here's somebody who's being taught it in pre-K. Right? They taught it to me when I was very young. And the scientific method, as we said earlier, is you go in with a hypothesis. And then you, do ex you think of an experiment that will uh, possibly falsify that hypothesis, and then you go to work. So what kind of, what, what's the kind of thing that happens in biology? Here's an example taken from a paper I published about a decade ago where we said, well, looking at yeast, uh, you can see that these particular sequence elements are hugely important for yeast doing what it does. And so if that's true, then we want a biologist to go knock out, which means to delete these sequence elements from yeast and make sure that yeast is broken and sick. So 2004, I went and showed this list to a very high-ranking senior yeast experimentalist. And I said, please, would you do this experiment? And the biologist said, well, these are obvious, and these are nuts, and this has been seen in some cousin of yeast, and this one maybe I'll get an undergraduate to do someday. Check back with me in six months. Right, so you doing some analysis without an experimentalist involved and engaged lowers the probability that some experimentalist will actually action on your insights. Uh, and I was thinking of that conversation a little while ago when I did something similar at the New York Times, but I, I can't tell you what it is. But trust me that this is super cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I can't tell you what I, we did, but we did something super cool. And we said, look, this attribute is hugely, I mean, hugely important. Right? This is a really important attribute. This one's a pretty real important attribute. Let's go do some experiments and test this. And I showed it to somebody who's not a quantitative person, and that person said, well, this thing over here kind of reminds me of something in Facebook. And this thing over here is kind of good. So maybe we'll look into that, come back in six months. So uh, it was like the same experiment I had had with this biologist a decade <laughs> earlier. So it's, it's really helpful to befriend experimentalists. And the experimentalists in the real world are people who write to prod. Right? The people who have permission to actually write the code that is going to change the website, those are the people you want to make friends with. Uh, so at the New York Times, we, we, you know, we have different people who control experiments. Dr. Crespo, Dr. Crespo is somewhere out of the audience. I think she can tell you about experiments that, that are done at the New York Times. Uh, you'd like to make friends with people who actually can action your insights. Because right? otherwise, you're just going to make a list of things that are really important, or you think are important, and try to get somebody to action on them. But it's much better to go into an analysis hand in hand with the person who actually writes to prod and the person who actually controls the site in the real world. For a small company, that's much easier. For a bigger company, you might have to go find them first before you start doing your analysis. So that, that is a lesson learned. Yes, please. So, I mean, when you're doing these analyses, you're not, like, getting a... But to me, it sounds like it's a subject matter expert, somebody who knows, who can describe the data or explain the data you're analyzing, and then you're finding insights about that data. You're not engaging with them first to explain the data that you're analyzing, or if I've got an experimental with some subject matter expert. Uh, well, I mean, so I think the job of the data scientist is to speak subject matter as well. So, you know, the, like, it's not enough to just get epsilon better performance with your reproducing and kernel and coverage base, right? Like, the, the, the job of the data scientist should be to be communicative in the domain, in the domain, right? You should be able to, to, to communicate with the subject matter experts. I'm just saying for a big company, you might do some analysis, and then, like, getting somebody else to action on it after the fact is going to be a lot harder than if you engage with them first and get them to walk hand in hand with you towards the analysis. Right? They're more likely to actually action on it once a, a result you've come together hand in hand. Right? So in biology, this happens all the time. You get like, theoretical physicists and biologists, and sometimes they iterate really well, like two years later. You know, like you do something in theoretical physics, and then two years later, somebody does an experiment, and then five years later. I remember I, I did a theoretical calculation in 97, and then like somebody verified it in like 2006. Right? But like in the real world, it would be nice to move faster than nine years to get a relationship between predictions and somebody actioning on it. So the best way to do it is, you know, like when theoretical physicists and biologists pair up and they say, we think this mechanism is cool, let us together go do an experiment together. So that's a piece of advice for data scientists in the real world is, 
a lot easier to get people to action if you go into it with the person who writes to prod or owns the business question or something like that, rather than doing the analysis and then approaching them afterwards and telling them found this cool stuff. And you know, same thing in biology. In bi biology, it's a little easier to download people's data now, but, uh, but really the same sort of social, that's sort of a social engineering observation. Make friends with the people who do experiments. Okay, so that's sort of practices. Let me say a few things about actual skills. Like what are the actual skills that I, that I want my students to know in academia? and that my collaborators and I uh, profit from in the real world. One thing is to find quantifiables. So find some quantitative measure of good uh, so that when you just do an infinite number of different manipulations of your data, you know whether things are getting better or worse. Right? So if somebody hands you a bunch of data and you do manipulation one and you make a picture, and then you do manipulation two and you make a different picture, that algorithm, in my experience, doesn't converge. It's far better if in advance you say, usually because of some domain reason, I know that I want to optimize AUC on held out data, or you know, RMSE normalized by the variance, or some figure of merit that everyone's going to agree is a clear quantitative scalar metric, so that as you start doing different manipulations, you know if you're getting closer to the truth or farther away from the truth. If you just do, if you make one scatter plot, and then the next day you make a different scatter plot, it's hard to know if you've gotten closer to the truth or further away from the truth. The corollary to this is choose carefully. So choose very carefully what you think is your, your figure of merit. Like fitting to the data, here's an easy one. Fitting to the data is not necessarily a good one because tomorrow you might add new fudge factors. You might add new free parameters. If you fit the data better, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a better model. That's certainly not in the sense of more predictive. So choose carefully what is the figure of merit, but Choose some quantitative figure of math. This is something uh, I found useful. The other thing is do the dumbest possible thing first. So occasionally I work with people, students, or collaborators in the real world, and the first thought is we are going to deep learning this thing with an infinite stack of Dirichlet hierarchical Chinese restaurant buffets, or some like latest thing that they just read about. Please always do the dumb thing first, is the thing I say to my students and to my collaborators. Like, just benchmark it against PCA, please. Because chapter, you know, page four or page five of the paper is you're going to have to compare it to the straw man anyway. So just do that first. Right? Because then, once you've done LDA with, you know, or deep learning or whatever, then you can say, you know, we beat PCA by a factor of 10. Just, just do the dumb thing first. Because, right? and the other thing is, if it doesn't work with the dumb thing at all, you know, it should work a little bit with the dumb thing. Then maybe there's some problem in the way you frame the, prop, the, the analysis. Or maybe there's some problem with your data. So I will echo this um, wise tweet from, from 2012. You know, like when you're doing something in the real world, go read a couple of publications where people do some fancy pants new method. Look at the method that they all say, oh, this is much better than that simple method. Try that method first. You're going to have to benchmark against it anyway, so do that method first. Right, so before you do a graphical model with a nested stack of plates and some extra fancy nodes over here, see if you can do a graphical model with just, just three nodes. Just do the simple thing first. Uh, the other thing is, before you spend a lot of time doing massive feature engineering, right, before you spend a lot of time figuring out that one of my features should be this thing that I have to write uh, a MapReduce job that takes a day to run, and it calculates this new fancy statistic, just try to build a regression model with some really easy to get features first. Just again, just to make sure that things are working and sensible before you start spending a lot of time on feature engineering. Because a lot of times the thing that's the really main step is actually something very dumb that's just a complete blocker before you waste a lot of time building the right set of features. Uh, this is an example of um, you know four distributions that I think have same mean invariance or something like that. But you, know, you can fit them all to a straight line. It's okay. You know, later you can go back and look at the scatter plots and see that maybe you shouldn't have just fit them all to a straight line. But first, just try fitting them to a straight line, because you know if things broken, then you'll see it right away. Uh, the other thing is, before you do data science, you will probably have to do a lot of data engineering. So, you know, we're here at a meeting about data science, and there's a lot of attention to data science. There's far less attention to what used to be called ETL, which is now called data engineering. Like the ability to extract, transform, and load large data sets. 
particularly in the real world, like if you work for a company, if that company has a website, somebody is going to need to do the difficult data engineering, like maintaining, making accessible lots and lots of data, and making those data small enough that you can put it into your favorite piece of software and do some small data analysis with it. Uh, there will have to be some data engineering, and uh, this is a uh, go, go read this old and short blog post just saying, let's praise data engineers, because it's true. You know, everybody's doing data science, almost all the data science we're doing, particularly, you know, at web scale, you wouldn't be able to do it unless there were good data engineers. Around. Okay, so those are some skills points. That is, you will need either to know how to do data engineering, or you need to be in a company that's big enough that have, they have good data engineers. Let me make some cultural points about data science, and again, these are cultural points that I think are true both in academia and the real world. Uh, one thing, and to speak to the earlier question, is to be a community. Wait, wait. The, the thing that makes you a data scientist and not merely a machine learner, and again, machine learning is pretty hard, but the thing that people often say is the differentiator between data science and machine learning is your ability to listen well to domain problems, to be creative about reframing those problems as machine learning tasks, and then to communicate to people what you learned. Right? Why does your model work? What did you learn? Why did you do it that way? Be communicative. Uh, that I think of as a, as a key skill of being a data scientist. Another way of saying being communicative is to promote rhetorical literacy, like make it facile for the people around you, students, collaborators, business partners, to speak machine learning. It doesn't, doesn't help anybody, and it doesn't even help you in the long term if you try to be the only person who speaks data at all. You want to be in a community where everybody is able to speak at least rhetorically about data. Even if they can't, you know, do the stuff, uh, it would be good if you're in an environment where people at least know what you're doing. Again, I think that's also good for your job. You know, if you're if you're doing this kind of freaky stuff and it's ancillary to the business, and the business gets rough, you, you don't want to be the person who's doing something ancillary and freaky. You want to be doing something that everybody sort of sees, like ah, this shapes the way we do things. You know? uh, so promote rhetorical literacy. Promote the ability of everyone around you to make arguments with data, and to understand the methods you use. Uh, one way to do that is to build models that are both predictive and interpretable. So interpretable, for example, built out of easy to understand yes no questions, where those yes no questions are based on features that are meaningful to the domain experts, as opposed to, say, uh, k nearest neighbors. It's okay, k nearest neighbors might be great for your problem, but like you're not going to be able to summarize how this thing works. You know, while the way this thing works is you look at your six nearest neighbors, and these are our training examples. It's, it's a template and not a model. There's sort of not, not a sort of small feature set that you could say, these are the features that matter. This is what makes the difference between pig viruses and flu and bird viruses. Right? It's just like, well, we had these viruses and this one was a, it's close to that one under some definition. So uh, it is a it's part of being a good data scientist to be able to have a versatile set of tools so you are able to construct tools that are both predictive and interpretable. Uh, Another type of literacy is skepticism. And of course, the person about whom you should be most skeptical is yourself. Right? So when you have a good result and you get some good R squared or you get whatever KPI is big, you know, make the extra scatter plot and make sure that you're not fooling yourself. Like this is an example where you fit some things to a straight line and you're thinking, ah, it's this. But maybe you should look at the residuals. Right? This is something even an orthodox statistician would have told you. Go look at the scatter plot. Go look at the residuals. See if there's a trend in the residuals. Be critical and have the ability to dig just a little bit deeper and make sure that you're not nuts. Promoting that critical literacy also means empowering the people that work around you, even if they're not the people who are writing the R or whatever. You know, promote the ability of other people to question you and to make sure that you're not doing something that nuts. So promoting critical literacy, I think, is useful. And this is certainly true for my biologist collaborators. Right, like I want them to know what I'm doing enough that they feel comfortable doubting, right? And they feel comfortable asking hard questions about why my methods are doing what they do. Be empowering. Share your tools, right? Put your code on GitHub. Use simple tools like R that other people can use, right? That, that, that's something I try to do, right? If you go, go to bit.ly slash Wiggins lab, right, we distribute all the source code for all of our methods, sometimes in R, sometimes in MATLAB, sometimes in Python, but Whatever the tools we're using, we want other people to be able to use them. Uh, so be empowering so that other people can you know, speak data with you, right? and then all of you can do more data as good things. Uh, be transparent. Right? Don't try to be, don't try to do smoke and mirrors with what you're doing. Just 
try to explain it in a way that makes it makes other people feel like they know what the heck they're doing. And again, I think that's also good for your career. Um, promoting this literacy, as I said, is really about then three different types of literacies. Promoting functional literacy means letting other people actually do the stuff. Like, can they run R? Can they load stuff in the right library? Can they do their analysis? Critical literacy means can they talk back? Like, can they ask you really insightful questions about what you do? Which, which they may be able to do even if they don't know how to do the stuff. Like, being critical, being literacy, critical literacy is different than functional literacy. And rhetorical literacy. Promote other people having the ability to make arguments using data. And uh, I'm not making this up. All of this I just am totally stealing from an old argument about computational literacy. So, you know, 10 years ago, uh, people were making this argument about computational literacy. The computational literacy is really three different kinds of things. Go read some of this old reading on multiliteracy and just run it through a set script that replaces computational with algorithms. And it, it, it sounds totally prescient. Like if you take this stuff and you just run it through said, you could <laughs> blog it tomorrow and people would say, you are an awesome data scientist thinker. <laughs> because it, it's, it's the same insights, but like <coughs> we could really promote a much more data-driven set of companies, set of cultures, set of sciences by making it possible and empowering the people who work around us to have these different types of literacies. Even if they never need to, even if they never learn how to code, right, which is just the function of working with people and encouraging them to be able to make arguments with data and to be able to be skeptical of data arguments is very useful. Yes, please. So the point about uh, using, not using key nearest neighbors, or let's say if I need to use uh, neural networks or random forest, let's say if that is uh, the most optimum procedure that I have to use, how do I go about telling that to the business partner? How do I go about explaining that? Okay, so you're doing good right until the point where you said optimum. <coughs> Right, because then you really opened yourself up. Because now I can say, aha, but you know, how do you define optimal? What makes a good model? A good model is both predictive and interpretable. And we choose whether we want to design, you know, whether our desiderata is, desiderata is predictive power or interpretability, which one we choose. Right? Often, you know, you might do something in random forest, and for some problems it might set a near upper bound on your predictive power, but it's going to be damn hard to explain to people. You know, so benchmark it against logistic regression. You know, just just try it just once. You know, just just do the dumb thing once, right? And it may be that the things that turn out to have huge Gini coefficient or whatever also turn out to be the things with big coefficients. And it's going to be a lot easier to explain to people the thing in terms of uh, big coefficients than it will be. Well, I have a, a set of a thousand randomly generated trees where I did m try, but if I set m try to five, then you know like, you don't want to go there. <laughs> right? I just want to say like these are the features that really matter, and they have discriminative power. Right, and use use GLM net, right? You can still get pretty good predictive power. Yeah, sorry, this is an R meetup, so I should be <laughs> like, should be giving you props or yes please. So you said that um, you should be friend an experimentalist, which the Golden Sachs fellow said that you should be friend a subject matter expert. So my question is, why did the New York Times hire a computational biologist when they really needed to hire a marketing guy with a marketing MBA with R experience? Uh, well, there's many ways to answer that question. So, <laughs> uh, anytime anybody asks you a question with why, you know, there's going to be like 12 different ways of answering that. Absolutely. I want to know your reason why. Uh, well, there already are really great people with MBA skills. I, uh, I don't know if there's, I don't know how many people are both MBAs and, and code and R within the building, but there already like are really good people in the marketing department who have great domain expertise. Work with them, love them, learn from them. Great to have around. Uh, I don't know, historical accident, you know, I went to Mark Hansen last year and said, hey, I have a sabbatical. What should I do with my sabbatical? He said, do something nutty, like go to the New York Times. He introduced me to somebody who was over in the tech division. You know, I mean, why, you know, why, why was Hewlett Packard's first customer Disney? You know, I mean, it was really just the randomness of just this person happened to know that person. But uh, I will tell them when I get back that they should fire my ass too soon <laughs> and hire an MBA who speaks R. Thanks. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I mean, look, 
come with me to the tenth floor, no, I'm on the where, side where we where we will kick ass together using your MBA skills. No, I'm on your side. And my I'm bad art. <laughs> I, I work in the pharmaceutical industry, and so this was very entertaining to me to see because I'm on I'm you maybe like twenty years. Are you listening to Nirvana? I used to. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I, um, there, there's clearly not uh, a lock on who's allowed to be a data scientist. You may have noticed that you know people are calling themselves data scientists for a variety of backgrounds. So, sh sure, I mean, if you can convince somebody to hire an MBA who speaks R, awesome, rock it out, and, uh, you know, maybe this MBA who speaks R will be able to employ all of these skills. I, I think that's great. I don't I don't think you necessarily need to hire somebody who's a combinational biologist. I do think, though, that there are some commonalities between dealing with really messy data and dealing with people who have domain expertise questions that are not yet machine learning tasks, and the creative ask the creative task of trying to reframe those domain questions as machine learning tasks and then communicate what you've learned back to the domain expert. And those, I think, are very common in all of data science, whether that's machine learning applied to biology, machine learning applied to marketing, machine learning applied to baseball, you know, a lot of different things. I mean, the, the simple answer to why is, you know, it's just, I knew this guy, he knew that guy, which is the way most people get hired anyway. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I'm going to put on my, my marketing hat, eventually the people who really care about this are the people who are selling the advertising in one way or another, whether it's directly or through some ad network or something. And you said something about that you're not looking to have segments, you're looking to have models with attributes. Can you kind of explain that further? Because I'm just so used to dealing with people on the segments. business. Yeah, segments. <laughs> Uh, I guess all I'm saying is, you know, segments are not bad and like people speak segments, but um, it reminded me a lot of in uh, this problem where we were trying to figure out if these viruses came from birds or pigs, and the dominant paradigm in that field is to build a phylogenetic tree as a very difficult intermediate step, right? So let's say you're in marketing or advertising and you have intuitions in your brain Maybe there are, exists a thing called soccer moms. And maybe there exists a thing called frequent travelers. And mi but then when do you stop? Like, when do you stop making up segments? And then how do you know if you've designed your segments right? That's a very difficult intermediate task, whereas you might want to know something simpler, like, are these people going to come back? Right? And that's a prediction problem. And you can frame it as a prediction problem in terms of many attributes without ever having to do a really difficult intermediate task, like defining a bunch of segments in terms of soccer moms and diehard Daves and other, you know, social constructs, right? So uh, all I'm saying is the same thing Vladimir Vavnik likes to say, which is when you have a statistical task, don't try to do some much more difficult statistical task as an intermediate step. Like inferring a phylogenetic tree is has a definite identifiability problem in the statistical <coughs> parlance, right? Given a finite number of genomes, it's very difficult to say I have this one tree. And then you break up into like two different gangs, and one gang is all about integrating over trees. Another gang is finding about the best tree. It's a good gang fight. You don't want to go there. If you want to just tell did the genome come from a pig or a bird, then just build a classifier that tells where they came from. Right. So that's really what I'm getting at. Let's say that you have a bunch of people and you have something that you know is business relevant, like did they come back or not? Then you might be able to build a classifier without doing a very difficult intermediate task of saying, I believe that there are five types of people soccer moms, diehard daves, and a bunch of other things. And I'm going to build a set of rules which is going to identify those people. So look for cases where you can just let go and let R. You know, look for, look for places where you can let the math guide you rather than doing difficult intermediate steps. I think of segmentation as a very difficult thing, right? To sort of, to have a prior intuition about who your audience is. Segmentation is nice because what you learn in one context you can use in another context. I, I, I get that. Right? Maybe once you once you know that they have this interaction with your product, maybe you also believe that, that you might advertise them into a certain such a way. It, it helps generate hypotheses. So, from what I'm hearing you say, is you're saying look at the colleague, have a, an endpoint, and then do a tr predictive tree or logistic regression. Don't bother doing those um, 
you know, hierarchical clustering models and then doing individual trees. Just go, go for answering your question and don't worry about whether there are particular people who might not be that great for the, the model. Because I mean, I work with people who like to do segments, so. Uh, I would say don't worry because I worry all the time. But in particular, you know, when you have things that you get wrong, one of the one of the things that you do is to look at residuals or in the context of a classifier, look at the things where you predicted plus one and really this the output of, you know is negative. So I, I certainly believe looking at what you got wrong, and in fact looking at what you got wrong is where the the artificial artificial intelligence happens. That's where you are the learner. When you look at the examples that you get wrong, you are the one who figures out what are the patterns that are. Uh, outside this set of uh, features that are in your model. Right? Your, mo your model is, is in some hypothesis space, circumscribed by the set of features. Right? And if you see a bunch of things that you're getting really freakishly wrong, look at them. Right? And it may be that there's a pattern that you will learn using your brain rather than your fingers. Uh, and then use that to inform your model. Other hands, please. Yeah, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about uh, the interaction uh, in, in your space earlier you said uh, be friends with experimentalists and I want to drive on that uh, in, in, in your own field in biology perhaps you plot the hypothesis given that and you run some experiments and then those, the results from the experiments could drive the hypothesis and, and it could keep going that way and I'm wondering so, so from all that you've described so far you are it seems to me as if you're driving one iteration. You're saying that, okay, I'm going to do this prediction and I'm done. And my question is, can you, can you, take, can you take what you have understood and then gone back to the marketing guys or say that, look, you know what? Uh, if you were to do this additional thing, you might find more, you know, uh, uh, you know perhaps a, a, a new, direct, new marketing technique or much like, you know, I'm scaling beyond just A-B testing, but I'm saying that could you, could you run this iteration more than once? Right. So the answer to your question is uh, yes. And this is precisely how statistical modeling works. So this is, there's a very old art literature in statistics about the iteration between model building and running experiments. In fact, there was a great article, Dave, my Columbia colleague, Dave Bly, just put out this article in January uh, about uh, iteration and graphical modeling. So to come back to the previous questioner, yes, look at what you get wrong, right? And it's not the case that if you build a model and then the build, you build a model and then it says your experiment and then you convince your experimentalist friend to do an experiment and you get it right, that that naturally suggests an, a new hypothesis. A new hypothesis suggested when you look at what you got wrong. Another way of putting it is, you know, I, I've heard several Nobel Prize winners interviewed over the years and they never say that their eureka moment was eureka. They always say that their eureka moment was nuts. You know, that, you know, they're looking at their apparatus, and their apparatus is supposed to ping, and instead it pongs. And something totally outside their, their current understanding of what happened, and, and drilling down into what happened there is where they generated new hypotheses and understood. I think all of this model building is very useful for, you know, uh, well, like, the, the thing that you do when you're just doing learning without experiments can be very useful. Like if you're letting the math tell you the right model from a space of possible models, that's awesome. And that's a, you know as much as you can learn with the dead data set you've been handed. If you really want to go beyond that, you need to make friends with an experimentalist and see what the model that you learned from prior data gets radically wrong in this new context. And looking at the outliers and looking at the deviation between the model and the experiment is what drives your next iteration of, of modeling. Check out this paper from Dave Bly, January. I mean, it's 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 a I mean it's a very old historical theme in statistics that you should be, you should do iterative model building by looking at the difference between the experimental outcome and your consistent and your in your current statistical model. Yeah, I, I would certainly take it out, but my follow-up is uh, I'm curious to see if you have had similar experience at the outcomes. Uh, sure, but I mean I don't think like I, there's there's a there's a the, there's a finite extent to which my experience at the New York Times generalizes to everybody. So, like, rather than spend a lot of time on the nuances of like who I work with, who are all awesome and great, and you should come work at the New York Times. Uh, you know, let's focus on. Let, let me let me use biological examples because in a way they're much more universal. They're just examples about science. Uh, David Bly will be here later this year speaking. So when he gets here, tell him that Chris told you to read his paper and harass him about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. I was hoping you could uh, help us understand the mandate at, at the New York Times, and I was wondering if you could see what fill in the blank 
if I accomplish nothing else as chief data scientist in the New York Times, I must accomplish blank. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm building a team, setting a scientific tone for a group of data scientists, uh, and evangelizing for the powers of machine learning throughout the company in a way that doesn't do disservice to use judgment and uh, healthy functioning of a great company. I agree that that's, that's broad. But in fact, I was hired without a, without a specific mandate. I mean, part of that is you, you should understand that you know, the company is not static, right? So you, 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 you join, you, you know, people like to say that a startup is like trying to build a plane while you're flying the plane and running it off a cliff. It's, it's not like that, particularly because there's not, there's not a cliff. Um, but you know, it is a dynamic company, so I wouldn't say that I have one static mandate. But like, there's a, uh, there's a bunch of I sit surrounded by ETL engineers and data viz people. I sit surrounded by people who make sure that the data are there and of quality. They are also interested in learning from those data. One of the best ways to learn from the data and actually to QA the data is to try to build statistical models from those data. You actually learn a lot of things being broken when you try to build statistical models from data. You learn that there's problems. Um, and it's great to work alongside data viz people who help you render the results of those models. Just the visual display of quantitative information challenge is uh, non-trivial. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that I have one clear mandate. I can tell you, you know, my goals are to see, the same the goals that I have in biology actually, to see how far this machine learning stuff can be pushed and does it work. You know, like we all have this, many of us have this sense that like machine learning does kind of freakishly well in, in, in the presence of abundant data. I'm kind of interested in putting it to the test in context where it wasn't, you know, not like the UCI data set, but like in single molecule biology. Like it doesn't work there, right? Does it, does it really learn? You know, that, that's the kind of thing I'm interested in pushing. And, and you know, like real world messy data where you have to run a bunch of uh, map reduce jobs before you can turn it into a table. Please. Um, I, I know you're aware that Matt and we are starting the lead program. Sure. Um, maybe even harder than enough. So, and yeah, here I'm, I'm teaching. She and I are teaching classes. She, oh, for okay. the summer. So, um, what do you think of the importance of almost most journalists to run that kind of program, or is that just expected? Well, can you just comment on it? Just in general, is there, you're at the New York Times. Right? Yeah, so this, the safe thing, the, my safe answer is no, I cannot comment. And so let, let me get back to the original part of the talk where I said New York Times is awesome data journalist people, awesome computer assisted reporting, awesome interactive graphics people, awesome upshot people. I'm not doing any of that. Love those people, props, work with them, talk with them, high five them, but that's not what I'm, I'm trying to do. So I, it, it, the safest answer for me to say is no. However, when it comes to Columbia journalism, yeah, I'm really psyched about teaching data journalism to students this summer. We're probably going to use in Python, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like teaching data journalism to people who want to become computational. Like, the, the first time I went to a machine learning meetup in like, no. I, I've been going to machine learning meetups for a while, but I can remember going to a machine learning meetup in January 2010, and normal people wanted to hear about variational Bayesian methods, and I was like, this is a strange new world. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very excited for people who are going to build this future of journalism to want to know machine learning. Like, you know, I agree with Jefferson that like, given the choice between like functioning democracy and journalism, you need journalism because that'll make sure that you're functioning democracy. But I think it's very important for us to have functioning journalism. So I'm very excited for those people to want to learn how to learn from data. Thanks. Uh, financial markets, machine machine learning has a problem in that uh, models aren't stable. They, they vary and often vary discontinuously over time. What kind of, do you, run, do you run into those same problems and how do you check on them? The time scale for biology in most web companies is different and it's not adversarial. But distributions are dynamic. So, I mean, even Netflix knows this. It's not like it's not like finance has the monopoly on the fact that the distribution is drifting. <laughs> like, why does so? 
when Netflix Prize happened, the winners gave a lot of talks about their methods. And what they basically said was, our method is an ensemble method with like 300 methods thrown in. But one of the things they said was, and we throw away old data, right? So uh, there, are, there are many examples from the world, not just in finance, where your data are stale and you should throw out old data. Um, I, I can't think of one offhand where we've exploited that at the times, but you know, it, it easily could happen where we need to throw out old data and you know, we do an exponential moving average instead of an historical average over everything. I don't know, you know it might happen. Um, but it's not as adversarial as in finance because right, people are trading against you, there are algos, they're sniffing each other out, it's, it's a mess. But okay. I can understand, you're not playing a game, but what happens when a major news event comes up and all of a sudden Times readers are engaging with Times in a totally different way? There's big cool spikes in the data. <laughs> but I mean, I haven't, I haven't worked on a problem where I needed, where that somehow messed up my ability to learn from the data. Th there may come a problem, there may come a day where I need to predict something and, and big world events or, you know, catastrophic outliers that I have to take into account, but I, I haven't encountered a co uh, common, I mean, a problem where I needed to do that yet. I just have like three more slides, can I do those and then do the questions? I'm really almost done. So, uh, I just want to just summarize. So, Probably a smarter way than just pressing both hands. So promote rid of, that's the end. So that's the end of my body. And I'll, I'll just have some footer. The, the footer is, you know, there are, you, you should pay attention to the practices, the skills, and the culture of data science. You should demand them either in yourself or in the people you manage. The practices involve reframing questions as machine learning. Try to be wrong rather than not even wrong. Try to be relevant. Try to know the difference between having a hypothesis and just being handed the data set and then asking what questions you can ask from that data set. Make friends with experimentalists. It will, it will be much more effective. Uh, the skills, I think it's important to find quantifiables rather than just to make a bunch of plots because that algorithm doesn't converge. Try the dumbest thing possible first. Uh, look for small wins, just make some regression before you spend a lot of time on feature engineering. And also be friends with or be a data engineer. And in terms of cultural, I encourage everybody to aim for being communicative. Don't just do your craziness in a box and think that you're going to not be fired. Um, be skeptical of yourself and encourage other people to be skeptical of you. Be empowering and, and like make it facile for other people to reproduce your results or, or break your code and learn something from it. Be transparent, share your code, and promote literacies. Promote the ability of other people to do this. Uh, please do come find out more. If you know people who are looking for a postdoc, um, I'm hiring. Uh, the New York Times is always hiring all over the place. If you're front end, back end, data science, design, we're hiring. Um, and if you'd like to talk about more, of course, we'll talk right now. And I actually, a week ago, I just made an outline for this talk and put it as a guest on GitHub. So feel free to issue a pull request or make a comment on that outline. We can talk about it there. OK. Now that I've finished up my few slides, now let's do Q&A. Uh, yes, please. Just let me, with the interpretable models, what are your go-to, what are your favorites for interpretable models? Depends on the problem. I, I like classifiers. Yeah. Uh, I like L1 regularized regression. I like GLMnet with cross-validation. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, generally, L1 regularized models are easy to explain to people, particularly if they're linear. Like there's a nugget that's linear, I just add these things up. And then there's L1, so some of the things are zero, and you could say, don't worry about those things. Um, I like boosted alternating decision trees, again, because it's sparse, but it requires somebody to be willing to follow conditionally important features. So, uh, you know, years ago I asked a question about model selection to Andy Gelman, and he said, you know, I always think of model section as a red herring. It just depends on how many coefficients the client is willing to hear. So <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's very dependent on who your audience is. Um, yeah, I think it's very dependent on who your audience is and what problem you're trying to solve. But generally, I like sparse models, and I like something that has at least a linear component to it. So you can just say, imagine I'm adding all these factors. The truth is a lot of ML leads to EDA. So after you've done the ML, and you've identified what are the important features out of hundreds of features, go do some exploratory data analysis on those features. Just go do some conditional histograms with the things that turn out to be important. 
because it may be a lot of the, it may be that you used a big hammer and the big hammer was great for separating wheat from chaff in a, in a high dimensional space of hypotheses but now you've identified a, a handful of hypotheses now apply some old school EDA to those and then maybe that a lot of the story is there and the high powered high dimensional ML is what leads you to the right smaller set of features please uh, let's say that you're the, the first data scientist or one of the first data scientists uh, hired by a well-established company to sit around for a while, and there are any number of different areas that of their operations that can be optimized. How do you decide which problems to attack first, which to prioritize? Um, here's what I would do, hypothetically. Be a good listener, study the org chart. <laughs> Figure out what the people who are in power fear and build a quantitative model that predicts that thing. <laughs> Next question. Yes, please. Uh, when the slide about the yeast, you don't have to go back to it, but when you presented it to the experimentalists, yeah. and they said, like, oh, yeah, this is obvious. These are interesting and these are crazy. Did that impact like how you thought about the question, or did you like learn anything else from that about? Sure, it traumatized me enough that I'm talking about it on stage <laughs> ten years later. Because <laughs> um, you can think of like the stuff at the top being like, oh, this was obvious, but it still taught you something, right? Like it was obvious, or we thought that going in, and now we confirmed it. Like, is there some way that it changed the way that you sort of present these questions, or do you sort of run them by domain experts? When you have your hypotheses, did it change your analytic workflow at all? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things is I have to do the fishing expedition before I go to the experimentalist. So it's a bit of a lazy thing to go to the domain expert and say, here's a list of stuff, what do you think? So it's better for you to do the literature search first and figure out, ah, this is obvious, this is plausible because it happens in Palm Bay, so it should happen in Cerevisiae, right? These I don't really believe. So then instead of just saying, hey, what do you think, you should say, hey, look, this first thing turned out to be first, and that's a good sanity check. So instead of saying, it's obvious, you say, this is reassuring. My model fi figures out as its first feature, this thing that we should think about is, and I think it's better to lead somebody by the hand and say, like, here's an awesome thing that we would publish in science if you showed that this thing actually shuts down cell cycle, or something like that. Please. Uh, so you said a minute ago, um, reminded me that when people think of machine learning or running, being a data scientist, they think of running this model. You're running variational days or in markup models or whatever, and that's what you're doing. And that may be the end product, but along the way, so much of what you need to do falls into either exploratory data analysis, yes. understanding your data, or kind of post-regression analysis, look, looking at residuals and stuff. Yep. And I find those are the kinds of things that fall into the holes of education yes. that we often teach yes. you know, as if, you know, here is the model which yes. is testing the hypothesis yes. and reality yes. is so much messier and yes. so much more prone to miscoding yes. that, you know, whatever, whenever you teach those basic analytic skills, how to draw a scatter plot, you know, how, how to just look at your data, I think that's underemphasized. Totally agree. In fact, four years ago, I co-authored a blog post called The Taxonomy of Data Science, in which we talked about this sort of process of data science, obtaining data, scrubbing data, exploring data, modeling data, and interpreting data. And modeling data is the little tech nugget they'll teach you in school. Like, here's a class on supervised learning, here's an unsupervised learning class, right? Everything else there's hardly any classes on. One of the reasons we created a class in exploratory data analysis and visualization at Columbia was the idea that you know a lot of the interpretation is drawing the right chart, right? Like knowing what figure to draw, even after you've done you know your cross-validation test or whatever, is still non-trivial. Um, and exploring your data in the beginning, you know, as I mean, Tuki has a whole book on it, right? Exploratory data analysis is like it's non-trivial. So um, and and certainly the data engineering and the data scrubbing, right, is is not part of the usual education. So I agree. So yeah. So there's. Right, there's, there's many ways of thinking about this set of different tasks. Actually, we co-authored this blog post and then Hadley posted on the bottom. Actually, it's not a line, it's a loop, right? Because you always have to iterate. And after you've done some interpretation, right, and of course Hadley is in a way echoing, you know, Box and great statisticians from days of yore, 
uh, and Dave Bly's recent paper, you know, that you go and you look at the outliers and you look at what your model gets wrong and that educates you about what your next model should be. Yes, please. Um, I, I really like the, the ideas you brought up uh, surrounding literacy and I'm just wondering if you have any practical tips for how to promote literacy. You know, I, and as a data journalist, one of the things you struggle with is sort of, you know, once you get outside of, you know, averages and odds and maybe simple ratios, percentage changes and news and presenting that to a general news audience, you know, people start to lose their attention pretty quickly because they're just eye eyes laid over, you know, when you bring up things like PFAS, you know, Pitching story, whatever. So, uh, any tips for promoting that literacy? Yeah, go go look at the upshot. So at the upshot, they'll have a story. Sometimes they'll have an interactive gra graphics, and then at the bottom they'll say, "If you want to see the story for how we got these data, click here." Right. So they have one of the, one of the recent things has a whole blog post basically about I read this article once in this book and it mentioned this fact of passing and I thought, holy bejesus, that means somewhere out there there's a data set that says how each individual quantile, uh, decile of the economy has fared in these different countries. I have to find that data set. And then I looked in this place, blah, 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 blah. Right, so that's the kind of thing that you don't put in the main body of the article, but you empower other people by talking about how you actually did that. And then click here for the GitHub. Click here for the Excel spreadsheet. Right, so I think there's a lot you can do to empower people. And if you're willing to tell all those stories. People in science often talk about how we don't have a journal for um, irru irru um, negative results. Right, and you know, in different cultures of science, you don't have this sort of storytelling aspect where when you present the talk, you talk about all the wrong turns you do, right? There's no page limit on the internet. So if you want to, you could link to a blog post where you talk about how hard you worked to get those data, right, and about all the things you did wrong. You can link to the code in the, in the, in the repo, right? This is something I've been saying in the name of reproducibility in the computational sciences for half a decade. It's now happening in journalism, right? Mainstream media are, are making websites that link to code, link to GitHub, and link to Excel spreadsheets. It's totally doable, and, and there's no page limit, so, so do it. Please. I have two questions. First one is, what do you think of the interplay between academia and, say, New York Times? Um, my second question is, how specialized are data scientists at New York Times? Like, do you divide data science into, uh, sorry, data scientists into, I don't know, back end? Uh, or right. So the first question is easy to answer. Uh, academia works well with tech companies, and the New York Times is becoming rapidly a tech company. So I think ac ac interactions between academia and tech companies are a good idea, right? I think basically since Hewlett and Packard launched in 1939, you know, the, the, the record is pretty good. Academia and tech companies are good for the species, I and and the Times is simply becoming a tech company. Uh, specifically, like I'm a computational biologist. What's your piece of suggestion if I want for me if I want to work at New York Times? Yeah, so you're saying that you have to be um, I would say embody the practices, <laughs> skills, and culture of a data scientist that you've learned in in the lab with your thumb and with your fingers. Right, depending on whether you spent time as a wet person or a dry, dry lab biologist, Th those are difficult skills, and, and, and not just the math skills, but like the cultural skills of trying to advance the science using R. Um, those will benefit you when you go into the, the world, which is a mess. Right? But biology is a mess too, which is, which is why you're, you're well prepared. Um, your second question about specialization, sure, people have different titles. There, there's a growing number of data scientists in the New York Times. You know, there's people running R in marketing. There's people running D3, you know, at the cubicle next to me. There's serious ETL people surrounding me, and you know, who you might call data engineers, right? You wouldn't have called them that five years ago. But now we call them data engineers. Uh, and those people are reasonably specialized. Uh, their titles change all the time. Again, something that's weird to me about the real world is like in academia, a title changes once every three centuries. You know, but <laughs> in the real world, people's titles change. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I don't know that their t their titles are reflective of the specialization you're looking for, but yeah, different people. Everybody has a different sort of spectrum of, of superpowers that they bring to the table. I couldn't do what I do without making friends with the serious ETL engineers, right? So it's good that different people have different superpowers. So I guess you kind of touched on this earlier when you were talking about editorial reports being mandated, not looking at the data. I guess um, 
curious as to you know what you as the chief data scientist are doing with you know, your own user data. You kind of showed that chart that you couldn't really talk about. It's kind of what are you guys doing with your user data, and more generally, what do you think about you know kind of data data informing journalists' safe decision making? Yeah, um, I'm happy to say I don't make any of those decisions. So in terms of the org chart, I'm far removed from the newsroom. In terms of the elevator, I hang out with those people all the time. So um, we, we talk to each other. I, I don't actually have any authority over the newsroom at all. Um, so they're having their own conversations about the role of metrics and you know what is sacred and what is profane about quantitative things. The things I'm interested in are trying to inform business decisions uh, or even technical decisions using abundant data about mostly the way people browse, but also you know how they subscribe, how they use all the different products. You may have noticed that the New York Times has multiple products now, like there's multiple iPhone apps that have been launched and will launch in the near future. You know, so there's the website, there's multiple ways of interacting with New York Times content. Th there's just a lot of data, and there's, and there's a lot of problems, even irrespective of how the newsroom operates, which is fine, because the newsroom seems to be operating pretty well. That, that said, they're not, they're not data phobes. I mean, it's not like people who, it's not like when you start writing for the New York Times, you turn off your Twitter account and your Facebook account. I mean, these people, are they're, they live in 2014. They're aware of the internet. So um, they're not at all data phobes. It's just that in terms of the org chart, that's not the, that's not the change I'm trying to make. So like, talk to the data journalists, you know, high five, great. But that's, that's not part of what I'm working on. I guess more generally, could you kind of speak to some interesting use cases or kind of how you're applying the data you're seeing? As soon as you come work with us. Once I get, once I get you NDA'd up, <laughs> I will reveal all. Uh, but other than that, it's probably better for me to talk about practices and, and culture. Uh, I particularly enjoyed your comment about the importance of, of being wrong or at least potentially wrong. Uh, and it seems to me that particularly as the size and availability of data kind of blows up, the number of ways in which you can come up with a stat to make dairy data the best is growing really, really rapid. Oh, yes. <laughs> and this was something which, while I was in academia, frustrated me tremendously, is that it seems like there are far more people interested in finding, a, finding ways to put dairy data at the top of their statistic than there are in like actually answering a, a falsifiable question. And I was wondering, specifically in the context of academia, uh, you know, how do you see us kind of handling this this problem, right? Like, how do you overcome the fact that a large portion of the academic com community is essentially uh, non-quants, right? They they don't speak data. Uh. Yes. So, uh, look, science is done by human beings. So, science is done by scientists, and scientists are human beings, whether they know it or not. Or not. So, you know, scientists are going to do things that human beings do. They're going to want to write a paper. And, you know, when they get that Derek Jeter is the best or that, you know, BRCA or some other important gene is really important, they'll publish. Right? And that's, that's good for their careers. Right? So scientists are human beings. Um, what can we do about that? Well, we can shame them. <laughs> so what, what can we do about that? I mean, we can create a, a, a culture of people who are critically literate in data science. So that, that type of critical literacy is when you pick up a paper in Nature and it says, we found that Derek Jeter was the best or some equivalent, see Supplemental Figure 5. You look at Supplemental Figure 5, right? And you download their code. And when their code says, you know, on, on line 137, printf, Derek Jeter is the best. <laughs> then you, you write a scathing blog post that directs everybody to line 137. And some people are doing that. I don't necessarily advocate that for your career <laughs> until maybe you're tenured. But <laughs> once you're tenured, you know, bring help. That's your moral obligation to the students. Right? It's like to indoctrinate young people before they read some paper and think, well, it was published in science. I guess Derek Jeter is the best. Please. Logo? <laughs> Turtle? Uh, I don't know. I started coding in the 70s in basic, and then I, they made me take AP Calculus, which at the time was in Pascal. Now it's in Java. 
Uh, then I became a scientific computation person and somebody sat me down in a windowless room with a Spark 360 and said, here's a book on Unix, here's a book on Fortran, here's a book on chaotic dynamical systems, see you in three months. And that's what I did, right? And they said, go to the Unix tutorial for VI. And I did that. So I started on Fortran. I did Fortran for from the 80s till the beginning of this century. Then I started using MATLAB to output to visualize the output from my Fortran. Then I started using MATLAB for real. And then I started using R and Python to keep up with my students because they were doing things that I didn't understand. And now I speak really bad R and a little bit of really bad Python. Mostly, actually, that's, that's a lie. Here's what I speak, shell. <laughs> the truth is what I speak is I write a lot of shell scripts because a lot of data science is obtaining ex and like munging data. And at the last possible minute, it becomes some highfalutin language like R. But like it's almost entirely shell scripts until the last possible minute. Please. If, you let, if you're doing an A-B test on something and you're letting it run for a while, and this goes back to like, I guess, power and sample size, you could let it run for a while and eventually find something significant. And you're not even controlling for the fact that you're kind of doing multiple testing as you let it run. Because a lot of these programs are canned in like Ruby or Python that, that do A-B testing. Um, so, and also, <laughs> You know, we, the, the p-value is obviously an issue, especially if you're not correct in the testing. So, so how do you choose between the two models that you use? Did you let this thing go? Yes. Uh, I'm not a p-value person. I tend to choose a model that's most predictive on held out data. That's just sort of my mindset. I should clarify, though, that I'm not an AB person. I'm friends with the AB people. They rock. I love them. High fives. But I'm not actually personally doing AB tests which means I'm also not doing p-values to advocate when to stop doing p-values, uh, A-B tests. It's a hard problem, it's not my problem. Pro props, to the <laughs> props, to, props to the people that have to deal with it. In terms of p-values, I tend not to speak p-values. What I tend to speak is there's a countably uh, finite, but like really large number of models, and I want the model that is the most predictive. If I want to put a p-value on it, I can. But that provides, that mandates that I'm going to tell you what the null model is. In most cases, that's a non-trivial task to s assert what the null model is. If it's a supervised learning task, then I can usually generate empirically a null model under permutation testing. Even then, I have to say, how am I going to permute my labels? What's sacred? What's profane? What set of covariates am I going to mandate they stay the same? And what set of covariates I'm going to allow to vary or permute? And at the end of it, you have something that's like a mortgage rate, where it's boiled down to a single number, but you really have to look at all the fine print to know if you're being swindled, which is why I, which is why I tend not to, in, to embark on p-valueology unless the referee demands it. So you determine the set of models that you're comparing? I write down a, I write down a, a hypothesis space, a set of many, many models and I attempt to make those models out of features that are individually interpretable. And then I use the right math, which is generically machine learning, in order not only not to overfit the data, but to find the models that are most predictive on held out data. And the models that are most predictive on the held, on the held out models, on the held out data, are the models that allow me to sleep best at night. And I can do that without ever saying the word p-value. In fact, I can often do it without even saying the word probability. Loss function optimization. That's my mindset. Thanks. Please. Here. Good. So I look forward to discussing more at the after party, which our host will tell us where it is. <laughs> <laughs>